Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this webinar, Opening Up Food Data. We're here today to discuss how open data standards can support the growth of thriving local food systems. More concretely, we're going to hear about the work of one specific project that's working in this space, the Data Food Consortium. My name is David Thomas, and I'm Projects Manager at Open Food Network Canada. Open Food Network Canada is a not-for-profit and one of a network of 22 national teams around the world working together to develop an open source digital public infrastructure for local food with the goal of tech enabling socially just and regenerative food systems. Here at Open Food Network Canada, we're delighted to be co-hosting this event with our friends at the Laurier Center for Sustainable Food Systems. Special thanks uh, to Amanda DiBattista and Heather Reed for all their event logistics support in the run up to this event. We're extremely grateful for that. Um, before I get any further into details, I want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the Ottawa Gatineau region, the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe. And I want also to affirm Open Food Network Canada's commitment to supporting and participating in the process of decolonization that our food system so desperately needs if we are to achieve food sovereignty and food security for all the people of this land. This public session is being recorded and everyone who registered for this event will receive a link to the recording in the next week or so. Um, I also want to add that for those of you coming new to concepts like open data standards, data consortiums, or even open source software, please don't be intimidated. One of the goals of this webinar is to introduce these terms and unpack some of their implications for local food folks. So if you are a farmer, food hub manager, or simply an eater committed to supporting local food, and you want to know what open data standards can do for you, rest assured you've come to the right place. In terms of format, this is a 90-minute session. The first 45 minutes, uh, we'll hear from Clementine Dribolo and Ra Rachel, Rachel Arnaud regarding their work with the Data Food Consortium. We'll hear a little about the day-to-day -day running of the initiative, how it got started, and also get a bit more background on some of the technical dimensions of the project. Following Clementine and Rachel's presentation, we're delighted to be joined by Professor Sarah Rose of York University, Irina Nesevich of Carlton University, We'll offer their responses to the presentation and raise a few questions to get our conversation together kick-started. Following uh, Sarah and Irina's responses, we'll, we'll leave the last 25 minutes of the session for a general Q&A. In the meantime, if you have questions coming up as you hear the presentations, please just drop them directly into the chat. You'll see that there's a Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. So click on that to enter questions as they occur to you, and we'll be sure to get to as many of them as we can at the end of the session. I think that covers all the housekeeping items. So that all that remains for me to do now is to introduce our two speakers and offer just a little background on the Data Food Consortium itself. So the Data Food Consortium is a collective of food tech firms, members associations, interested citizens, and local authorities who are working together to encourage cooperation in local food systems, especially around data management. One of the Data Food Consortium's key initiatives is an interoperability project, which allows food tech platforms to communicate with each other and share data. At the core of this initiative is the consortium's effort to develop an open data standard, a common digital language used by all participating platforms. In accord with the collective shared goal of building an open, sustainable and fair food system, the Data Food Consortium is committed to the practice of transparent and democratic governance. Now for our first two speakers, Clementine Trivolo is has been a Data Food Consortium coordinator and community leader since September 2020, where she is working to support a more sustainable and equitable food system. Prior to joining the DFC, Clementine worked 12 years in marketing and project management within global food companies. She's also been involved in various social enterprises over the last few years, including co-founding Zero Waste Shanghai. Rachel Arnaud has, been, has over 10 years experience in building and maintaining web platforms, targeting better social and ecological impacts. She joined the Data Food Consortium project two years ago as a project manager, and she holds a master's in sustainability, environmental economics, and GIS. And so with that said, I'm going to hand this over to our uh, presenters. Thank you so much, David. And... Hello everyone and thank you um, Open Food Network Canada and the Laurier Centre for welcoming us here. We are very happy um, to be with you and I'm just sharing my screen at the same time. I hope it works. So um, yes, I'm Rachel and um, I will shortly introduce you a bit of the context 
of um, the birth of this project called Data Food Consortium and and why we we started it. So. <clears throat> At the beginning of it, well, I, I haven't mentioned it, but um, we are two <laughs> French people, <laughs> so we are um, we have a context in France, but I think it's it's quite similar in in Canada, where we have a, a highly diverse short food and local change systems with a large variety of um, models like buying groups, CSA. Um, um, we have also uh, a lot of startups that have built solutions like the food assemblies. And this is only for sa sales, but we have lots of other um, uh, tools and, and uh, actors that have started to emerge addressing uh, this type of sales. Um, so what um, happened uh, when looking at the type of market and and being part of these actors, um, we really noticed that um, in order to help uh, these um, local project to scale and work together, we really needed to be um, forming some kind of a distributed network so it's really one of the core values of the open food network so there's this project really was introduced and thought of first within the, the open food network so this was the start so in france we were um, looking at this in order to um, really go deeper into um, the how we can better help local food chain work and by looking into this we um, started regrouping other competitors that were really doing um, either the same uh, project then and solution that the open food network was building or um, complementary solution like when the farmer is looking for uh, selling their food they're looking for uh, of course platform to do online sales but maybe they're also looking um, for a solution to send out their emails or doing their accounting and and so on and so on um, yet uh, one place where um, the let's say general supermarkets are really doing better so far is that they have a uniformed um, system of tools that they can offer to um, their suppliers and therefore being really efficient in terms of how they help them sell th their products which is very difficult to replicate when you're um, uh, an, an, an initiative that really wants to build a distributed network where everyone has um, an equivalent uh, power and not rebuilding an entire complete system uh, on their own, but rather really um, put um, an, the effort in having each um, actors on this chain being able to work together and and provide services that are have a, va a very large variety of uh, aspects and doing so producers were also faced with um, a problem on their sustainability and economical sustainability like if you want to sell your products um, on directly to the consumer and you see that the market is really booming in terms of platforms that helps you to sell well you're tempted to sell your products in several different platforms but today one of the big problem is that each platform is not communicating to one another that means that if you want to sell your products or sell your products and also use for example another tool to do accounting or route optimization for your delivery well you're you're forced to basically move your data yourself from one tool to the other because each tool is very uh, completely independent and doesn't talk to the others so this is why we are speaking about silos i'm not really sure it's a, 
the proper English term, but it really means that each organization and each tool has its re own own environment, and it's difficult to make these environment um, si sizing into uh, each other. Um, so this is really the problem that led to, okay, let's try to find a solution together and not rely on big, building a big monopoly of, um, of tools that um, will not help distributed network to, to grow. Um, so this was really the birth of the idea for, for um, this project. And to finish and before I hand over to Clementine, I just wanted to add that it's not something that is really particular to the food market. Um, it's all, also something very more general and a, a problem that we have on, on the internet and that other people are looking at it. And especially if you want to um, have uh, a deeper look, I suggest um, you read a little bit about um, what the team of Tim Berners-Lee, so the person who created uh, the, the web, uh, is, is working on. And you really have a large movement of projects that now technically offer to separate the data from um, the tools that are consuming these data and offer a lot more uh, power to the people who the data belong to. Um, we will go a, a lot more into details into this, but yeah, just to give a bit of more perspective on the, on the topic. Clementine, I hand so, over yeah. to you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, um, so as uh, Rachel just explained, we are uh, facing this, um, what we call this data siloing, I'm not sure it's correct in English either, but <laughs> this silos effect uh, when it comes to digital tools uh, in, sh in uh, short food chains. Uh, so what can we do to fight uh, this issue? And actually the solution is in a quite tricky word and don't be afraid by this word. Um, it's interoperability. It's quite difficult to pronounce in French uh, as well. <laughs> so for me, it's quite a challenge to pronounce it in English, uh, but it actually it's quite simple. What does it mean? Interoperability is the ability of several computer systems to communicate, to share and use common information. Um, so I will try to make it very concrete for you uh, I'm not a geek person, I'm not a technical person myself, so it's quite easy for me to translate that kind of concepts into um, examples that even your grandmother uh, would be able to understand. That's the idea. Uh, so going back to um, previous examples shared by Rachel, when it comes to sell products uh, in uh, short food chains, uh, if a producer wants to use several marketplaces um, this platform should communicate uh, in order to make um, data input easier and quicker for this producer. For example, if this producer wants to post uh, his catalog, his product catalog on several uh, platforms, he shouldn't have to input the same data, the same catalog, several times across platforms because it would be a nightmare for him. Actually, it is a nightmare today for him because most of the time it is how it works today. Um, and also we, are, we believe that uh, this platform should communicate uh, to make uh, data updates uh, um, easier and automatic to make, for example, stock management easier and data more re reliable. So if I, I take here a concrete example, um, you can see on this slide, we have uh, two plat platforms. So we have platform A, platform B. Uh, let's say that there are two marketplaces uh, and today a sales is happening on platform A. Uh, let's say that, for example, a consumer has ordered two bunches of radishes uh, of, on, on this platform A from one specific producer. So then, uh, of course, the stocks of radishes on this platform A will automatically decrease by two bunches because of the sales. But uh, today, platform B, if it doesn't communicate with platform A, A is not informed about this sale. 
But if, it's if it communicates uh, properly with platform A, then platform B will also be immediately informed and will, uh, of course, will uh, also be decreased by two bunches of radishes. And this, um, this example uh, may sound simple and obvious. Uh, maybe you, you think that it's obvious, but actually it doesn't happen this way today because today platforms do not communicate. They are not interoperable. So usually it's not the case. And that's why today, as Rachel mentioned earlier, producers have to face so many issues uh, when it comes to uh, manage their catalogs of stock on several platforms at the same time. So here comes DFC, and maybe we can go to the next slides. Um, so uh, Data Food Con Consortium, uh, who are we? Um, we are um, a collective, a group of small firms, associations, uh, citizens, territorial communities. It's a group of people that is wishing to help uh, short food chains to change scale. Um, and the idea is that we encourage cooperation in the sector. We are putting producers and eaters uh, back to the center and uh, uh, our main objective is really to try to uh, help producers to take advantage of digital tools, but in an easy way. Um, and we aim to increase the efficiency uh, also and uh, of uh, short food chains and to pave the way to future innovations. So how do we do that? Uh, we do that through uh, interoperability standards that allows platform to communicate. And our strategy is quite simple, actually. We, 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 it consists in defining a common digital language uh, between platforms. So platforms being marketplaces, being supply chain airports, or other kind of platforms, uh, which allows um, this digital language allows us to share data and to connect people and initiatives. Uh, it's an open source and inclusive standard uh, that comes with uh, common rules. And these common rules um, allow to build confidence between actors, uh, because you have to be aware here that actors are often uh, competitors. So we have here a kind of a, um, bold projects that gather together people that are usually competitors around the same, uh, same project. Um, and actually this open digital language is not a tool made for geeks or tech people, as you could think, because it sounds quite technical. It has a very concrete and positive impacts on multiple actors of the short food chains. Uh, going to uh, the next uh, slide. Um, actually, so main, main people uh, being concerned by this language are producers and short food chains organizers. Um, they can save time in using digital tools thanks to this idea of a synchronized data um, and focus on their core business. So their core business being producing and selling. Uh, so it's not about using digital tools. This is not their core business. Producers are not here for that. They are here for producing, selling and uh, maintaining good relationships with consumers. Uh, and this um, producer can benefit from more uh, reliable data. Uh, this allows them to reconcile their stock from a marketplace to another, uh, and it's automatic. They can have access to one common pictures of their stocks through all platforms using the same standard. Uh, so the, they are the main um, uh, people that benefit from this language. But at a larger scale, at a more general perspective, if we look at the short food chains ecosystem market, uh, this, this market will be able to change scale uh, thanks to all these cooperations, all the market opportunities created by such a standard. Uh, and um, quite a quite important point here with that kind of standard, we. Um, we pave the way to transport sharing solutions. And uh, let, me, um, exp uh, let me explain to you uh, how, why, why we pave the way to transport sharing solutions. 
um, actually because um, the idea also behind the standard is to allow producers to be informed in a very simple manner in, in one picture, in one big pictures about their own upcoming orders uh, and deliveries across all platforms that use the standard. Uh, but also at some points, if we go a bit further, they will be informed about upcoming deliveries from other um, producers that can be uh, managed together with their own deliveries. So that means uh, basically that two producers will be able to share the same transportation need. And by doing that, we actually address one of the key issues that we face today in uh, short food chains. Um, short food chains, as Rachel mentioned earlier, are not very efficient uh, when it comes to supply chain. Um, the, because data is not shared today. Uh, data delivery in particular is not shared. So that means that producers uh, can't be aware of what's happening in the market and they can't opt optimize and share transportation easily with other producers. So as a result, um, what we see usually is that we see a lot of delivery trucks that are often half empty. Uh, and this has, of course, negative impacts on cost for everybody and on the environment. Uh, so this is something that uh, actually is a big issue today because, uh, because um, we don't have interoperable systems. Um, and uh, we have noticed, we have a lot of researches here in, in France, but also in other countries that show that long food chains uh, tends to have a better carbon footprint than for short food chains. And you wouldn't believe in that. Uh, usually people think that short, uh, short food chains, local uh, food chains are much better when it comes to the environment. But it's true, but not on the, on, on the transportation uh, point of view. Uh, and uh, actually, when we implement a standard, when we have an open standard, we can fight the situation and make uh, short food chains much more efficient much more striving. So this is the, uh, the idea behind that. And um, now if we look at territorial communities, uh, for, for them, it's uh, that kind of standard allows them to develop short food chains in their territories. That means that they can offer to local people uh, better quality products, local products. They can support local economy, local agriculture, local jobs but they can also limit logistic flows. So meaning that the bad impact on traffic and carbon footprints coming from all these flows. And that is the reason why actually in a, a data food consortiums, we are already supported today by several territorial communities uh, here in France, uh, because they see the interest in that, in developing short food chains while limiting logistic flows, because it's not always easy to reconcile the two. <laughs> so um, uh, now moving to uh, our ambitions, because behind these activities, there are actually big dreams, <laughs> but dreams that are that have a true potential uh, to uh, become a reality. Uh, they are already a reality uh, in a way, but we really need to reinforce them. Uh, the first dream being uh, an open and transparent and fair food system. And the second one uh, being a decentralized web, uh, a collaborative approach of big data. So if I uh, explain you first the food system, um, our idea here is to, to build uh, food systems where eaters can access to a good and healthy food, uh, products where producers can live in a decent way and where pl the planet is respected. And um, in our ID, uh, this food system is organized in a decentralized way. That means uh, that producers and eaters are managing their own um, fair distribution um, relationships, chains, either directly or indirectly, but with not too many distributors. There are always some necessary distributors, but the idea is to limit them. 
that, that's the idea of shop, shop food chains. And these uh, sh shop food chains create a very direct uh, relationship between the producers and eaters. And um, the interest of that is that it allows transparent uh, relationships uh, based on trust, uh, not only based uh, on trust on prices and margins, everybody is aware of, of the right prices and the right margins, but also uh, a trust on the quality or on the inner quality of products uh, and their potential impact on the environment or on, uh, on the health of the people. Um, so that's the idea of this uh, uh, food systems we believe in. Uh, and uh, while being multiple and spread across the countries, these food uh, chains should be efficient. Uh, it's not because they are multiple that they cannot be efficient. And they can be efficient because they cooperate and they share energies, they share resources whenever it makes sense. Uh, and to do so, these actors uh, speak a common digital language that allow them to, to share clear and necessary information um, uh, in the same time. And that's important also for us. They can remain independent and keep sovereignty on their decision, their personal decision and their personal data. Uh, so here it's important to, to understand that we are trying to create a balance between collaboration and independence. Uh, the idea that we, we, we think, we believe that we can make um, the common good um, a priority while preserving individual interests of each actor of the ecosystem. So that's the idea with these uh, fair food systems. And you see that this is actually related to the idea, the idea of a decentralized web. Uh, so here, referring back to uh, Rachel shared earlier when she talked about the future of the web, um, we are supporting a specific vision of what the internet should be. And this is the vision uh, of uh, Tim Berners-Lee, so the founder of the web. Um, he believed in, um, in a decentralized web where apps can read data on several databases, whatever their location, uh, which prevents people to input the same data again and again. So I think now you understand that this allows time saving, but that's, this is not the only thing. It's also keep data sovereignty. So here the data owners can choose uh, which data they want to share with whom and in what circumstances. Uh, this comes against uh, the main current models of the web, uh, where uh, everything is based on ownership of data and domination strategies and kind of a competition. Uh, this comes against that. Uh, the idea is really to have collaborations, but preserve the individual interest and data sovereignty. And um, and here I want to point out an important point. Um, yeah, at Data Food Consortium, we believe in uh, open source, but not really in open data. So, uh, we make a difference. Uh, uh, sometimes there is some kind of confusion between open source and open data. So I want to explain how uh, we think, uh, uh, what we really believe in. We, be, we actually support the idea of open source. So uh, that means that we allow people um, to access to our code, to modify it, to improve it, to uh, adapt it to their needs. Uh, this is open source. But we are not uh, supporting open data per se. Uh, because um, on our opinion, data should not be shared in a large audience used by others without the approval of the individuals that originally create this data, that own this data, for example, the producers. They should be able to say when they want to share it, what data they want to share with whom, and if they don't want to share, they should be able to stop that. That's the idea behind, uh, be, behind when, when I say uh, that we are not really supporting open data. Uh, we are supporting open data, with, but with limits, with some kinds of limits. 
because we want to, uh, to preserve individual interests. Hope it makes sense for you, but we'll be able to explain that later in the Q&A if you have questions, of course. So, um, so having these visions in mind, these dreams in mind, I think it will be now for you easier to understand uh, our strategy uh, behind this common standard. So going back to uh, our favorite word, interoperability. So <laughs> um, going back to this word, which so consists again in allowing platform to communicate and share data. Uh, there are actually several ways to make um, uh, platforms communicate. Uh, and at Data Food Consortium, we've identified three ways uh, for this communication. Uh, either we connect each platform to one another, one-to-one, -one, with an API. I hope this is the right pronunciation for that. Um, I will explain you what, what it means. Uh, our, or we agree on an already existing standard. Our last solution, we create an open standard in the center, and this is a chosen solution. But it's interesting for you to understand why we haven't chosen the other ones, because they are possible, but it's just that they are not aligned with our values. Uh, so the first one, connect platforms to an API. Uh, so API stands for Application Programming Interface. I won't go in the technical details here because I don't want you to panic. Uh, and again, I'm not a geek myself, so I'm not able to explain you in, uh, in very technical terms what it means. But I like to, uh, to use images to make it, to have people understand what it means. Um, so let's go to the real world, the physical world. Uh, when two human beings meet, uh, they and they don't speak the same language. Like for example, uh, an English speaking Canadian person meets a French person. They don't speak the same language. They have a first solution. It's to use the services of an interpreter of a translator. That's the first solution. And uh, softwares are actually like human beings. Uh, they use different languages uh, and they can connect through an API which is some kind of translator to translate data uh, from a language used by a platform to another. That's, that's a solution. Uh, and it works when we have only two languages. Um, but when we start to multiply languages, uh, like uh, human languages or software languages, a translation requires time and budgets that are not always available. So it's like, it's like finding interpreters in the United uh, Nations organization. Right? It's a nightmare, you have to hire a lot of them. So uh, eventually platforms are like human beings and uh, they are multiple, they speak multiple languages. And it's much more simple at the end of the day to use one common language when it comes to communicate with many uh, uh, people who are speaking many uh, languages. So, um, so it's, like, it's the idea of a standard. Is the role of a standard. Standard is like a language. So now we have two solutions. Uh, when we want to use a standard, a common language, either we agree on an existing standard or we use another a, a neutral one. So agreeing on an existing standard. So what does it mean? It means that we choose the language of one of the existing platforms. It's like in the real world, in the physical world, it's like choosing English as a universal language for all human beings. I think it makes sense. So there are a lot of advantages in that. Uh, it's quick and convenient because the language already exists. Uh, but if we, if, we, if, we, if we think twice, this creates some kind of inequalities and a power gain. It's like English. I love you guys speaking English, but it tends to be, <laughs> it tends to, uh, to create a significant advantage for um, people uh, having English as a mother tongue versus people that don't speak English. Uh, and that's, that's the problem behind uh, already existing standards. And indeed the digital world, uh, they are behind standards very critical political stakes and democracy issues. 
And every, uh, every citizen should, be, uh, should feel concerned. It's not only uh, tech people. Um, this is the, the one that defines the standards, actually, is the one that has the power, standard power. It's like GAFAM. It's exactly the GAFAM, Google, uh, Amazon, Facebook. They have the standard, and they are the, they are the one that uh, have the power. So how can we find a better solution, a fairer solution? Uh, we believe that it's through an open and neutral standard. Um, and uh, so here, the idea of an open standard is to invent a new language in a collaborative way. So of course, it's a lot of work. It's um, much more work than just picking an existing language, uh, but it's it's uh, it's fair and um, and it's much more adapted to uh, the needs of our uh, short short same uh, ecosystem. So uh, having an open standard means having a common way to describe the production, the distribution, all the protocols uh, to share data, so that every um, every actor has only to learn this language to communicate uh, with uh, the other actors. And they can keep their own languages huh, themselves, but it's just to have to learn another language to communicate. And this is an open and jointly managed standard, which is aligned with the distribution wave that we mentioned earlier. Uh, so our wish here is that application developers um, connect to these standards in order to allow platform to communicate. Um, I'm not sure we have time for the for the. So, to present in detail the FC standard, but I can explain you like very quickly. So the, this standard actually uh, consists, is, is comprised of various ontologies, you know, an ontology being a set of terms and concepts um, that are structured in, a, um, that are organized in a structure, in a, in a, in a scheme. Uh, there is a semantic ontology, a technical ontology, I won't go into details. If you have questions about that, I will be uh, happy to answer, even if it's not my expertise, I have to tell you, because huh? it's it can uh, comes quite technical. Um, I just uh, I prefer now maybe to explain you who's behind this project, uh, because I know some of you may be interested in that. Um, we have a lot of contributors, um, operational contributors, meaning the 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 most involved people being two main platforms here in, in France, marketplaces. Open Food France is, uh, is involved and so Cleo. And we are coordinated uh, by a virtual assembly, which is an association that is at the forefront of the, of the distribu distributed web uh, that is coordinating our development. So th these are the most involved people. And on the other side, we have uh, friends, we have platforms such as La Ruche TV or Cajet. There are other French marketplaces that are um, also supporting what we are doing and that will also adopt our standard. We also want to involve uh, 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 people from the supply chain, from the logistic uh, system, because we, uh, uh, as I said, we develop uh, also uh, functions around uh, logistics. And uh, we are supported on a financial standpoint and on a strategy standpoint by uh, uh, private and public uh, organizations, Ile-de-France being the regions including Paris and the suburbs, and Carasso being a private foundation. Uh, and we, we also uh, have the support of uh, academic partners, um, uh, in high and RMT, they are all uh, researchers that are uh, acting on uh, building a consistent, sustainable agriculture system, food system, basically. RMT being more on uh, short food chains, um, improving the knowledge about short food chains and uh, to, to, be, to be able to better support them. So as you can see here, uh, all these actors are basically French actors. But that doesn't mean that we want to, uh, to uh, 
to, to, to remain French actually on these projects. We have uh, global ambitions. We really want to make this consortium an, a global consortium. And that's why we are very happy today with Rachel to, to talk to you. Uh, we know that we have already a lot of contacts and interests from various countries, um, from various European countries, especially, but also a little bit from Canada and the US. So that's interesting to see uh, how the, this, um, this project goes easily beyond French frontiers, but we really want to open it even more. Um, a few words maybe on a uh, business standpoint, because uh, we, we've got already some questions about that. Um, so uh, we are, as you've seen, we, so, we are supported by public and private donations. Uh, so you know everything, our annual budget is about 100k euro. So I tried to, to make it um, uh, understandable in, uh, in Canadian dollar. I hope it's, uh, it's the right figure. Uh, and the idea is that tomorrow we want to, to, to have a, a more uh, financial, uh, financially um, sustainable and independent system. So our model should be more independent. Uh, and we have several ideas that we need to explore. Either we can ask for fees from the people that use our standards, or we can create services or products, apps, that are based on this open standard and that are um, that can be sold. Um, now, now a few words on our governance because it's quite interesting. Uh, we mentioned our very strong values. We are an open community. Uh, we are transparent in the way we, we, we communicate. That I think makes sense with what I've explained. Equity is very important. It means that we are an horizontal organization. There is no hierarchy between us. Uh, it's every actor is one voice. And we try to serve the common good while preserving individual interests. And uh, I know that uh, here also we have a lot of people from Open Food Network. And uh, of course, we have an historical and philosophy philosophical link with Open Food Network because uh, Data Food Consortium was created and incubated by Open Food France. And today we are still hosted by Open Food France, actually. Uh, but we are already independent on an operational standpoint. Uh, given the, the objectives and our approach, I think you understand that we need to be neutral and that we, can, we, we want to serve the, the common uh, good of the whole system. So we cannot serve the interests of only one specific actor. That's why, that's why we, we want to be independent from an open food network. Uh, it's, it will remain a key partner, of course, open food network, but uh, it will be at the same level of any other key partners of these projects. Um, and our governance is still a work in progress. We, uh, we still need to agree on official status and social codes. So we will create uh, uh, like legally an independent association very soon, a non-profit association. Uh, then um, just to, uh, to explain you where we stand today, uh, going to our, the key milestone of our project, uh, Data Food Consortium was created in 2016. We published the first version of the ontology in 2017. And in 2019, uh, we realized that we should develop a prototype. We call it Mon Catalog, uh, our catalog, my catalog, my catalog, to be our words, this is my catalog. Uh, the idea of this prototype is to be a proof of concept of our standard and, uh, and a way to improve it uh, in an iterative approach. Uh, but maybe we can uh, explain you that later. And in 2019, in, uh, and this year, actually, 2021, uh, we will keep uh, 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 developing this prototype. We are communicating more and more uh, through webinars in France and, uh, and in other countries, uh, building partnerships with, uh, uh, with a lot of organizations. So the idea is really to, to spread the word and to make this consortium a bigger uh, organization. Um, so just uh, as a conclusion, I just want to, to, to point out that uh, if we want to achieve our mission, if we want to, to, um, to make it possible, 
we need to have enough platforms people organization to adapt it uh, it's like a common language a common language becomes powerful only if it's shared and and if it's talked by many people so this is the same thing with our standard we need people to to get involved to to contribute to it to talk about it and we need to go beyond fun frontiers so that's a, a big message for you. We, we count on uh, all of you to talk about the st standards and to spread the word. And uh, you're very welcome to uh, join the consortium. And that's it. Um, you, uh, we will be uh, happy to share the, uh, the presentation. And uh, we've just put a few links, just so you know, um, uh, in the last slides, uh, you have a link towards our website. Uh, if you want to contact us, uh, you have our email address. And for tech people, our Gitbook and GitHubs with a lot of information. Uh, so that can be useful for you. And you will also have at the end of the presentation, the very end, Rachel's and, and my contacts, direct contacts. If you want to contact us, we'll be happy to, to help you. Thank you very much. Well. Thank you so much, Rachel and Clementine. That was a wonderful presentation. It's given us a ton to talk about. There's already a lot of questions uh, in the chat. So I want to keep us moving. And to do so, I'm just going to introduce our respondents, Professors Irina Nezovich and Sarah Rhodes. I'm um, just going to give you like their bios and then sort of hand the session over then to them for the um, next 15 or 20 minutes. Following that interaction, we're just going to open up um, questions to the floor and I'll be fielding questions that have come in throughout the session via the Q&A function. So for our next speakers, Irina Nezovich studies communication, culture and health. Her interests are in food systems, food labeling, healthy communication and advertising, health equity, informal economy and everyday practices, and the discourses of food health and regulations. As part of Fledge, Arena collaborates with community partners in Atlantic Canada and also supports the work, of East, the work in Eastern Ontario. Sarah Rhodes is an assistant professor in the Department of Social Science at York University. Her work focuses on political ecologies of land and food systems, settler colonial patriarchy, and concepts of sovereignty and justice related to food, water, and energy, and the ecosystems that support them. So now I'm going to hand this over to Irina and Sarah. Um, thank you, David. Um, I'd like to start out with uh, thanking uh, Clementine and Rachel, uh, not only for the presentation, but for all the work you're doing on this. And, and same goes to you, David, for not only uh, organizing this session, but also the work that's been happening on the ground in Canada with Open Food Network. Um, I'm going to start with a question that kind of riffs off of a couple of points, uh, Clementine, you made um, that are related sort of to governance and power issues. So in your presentation, you mentioned uh, you know, the, the power dynamics and, and implications to democracy. And uh, you seem to be acutely aware of uh, the various interests in food industry. And what I'm curious about is uh, it, it seems the set of values that guide the work you're doing are really um, invested in uh, doing this work in the public interest. So strengthening uh, regional territorial food systems, uh, really kind of uh, providing a service for producers and processors and eaters. Uh, and all of this sounds amazing. But as we know, sometimes initiatives like this, the more successful you are, uh, the more difficult it is to maintain those values, uh, values and, and the kind of uh, principles that come with them. So uh, is there anything that you might be doing or thinking about doing uh, down the road to sort of uh, ensure that this project can be successful, but at the same time, uh, not be eaten up by big players who might see the success of, of, a, of a platform like this or a, st a set of standards and try and um, turn, turn them into sort of a commercial interest. Is there anything that you have in place or are thinking about putting in place to, to basically protect an initiative like this from being eaten alive by some of the, the bigger corporate interests that, that have shaped a lot of the data world uh, in relation to food. Thank you, Arena. This is a very interesting question. Um, I'm not sure I have the audience with today because we are already 
uh, at the beginning, at the early stage of a project, even if we start in 2016, as I mentioned, it takes time. Uh, and uh, especially when it comes to governance, because up until now, we've uh, worked a lot on technical aspects of this project. But when it comes to governance, even if we have defined a lot of things and if we have clear values and we know what drives us, we, we still need to work a lot on it, actually. And this is a very good question. Uh, um, uh, today, it's not a big problem because we are not so many around the table. <laughs> uh, and uh, especially also because we are supported by uh, non-profit organizations, public organizations, as men I mentioned, uh, re uh, researchers in France, they are all public organizations. So they're very, they really uh, support uh, our values in that way. Um, and the various platforms that have joined the consortium, even though they are um, private and they have their private interests, uh, they share our values. Open Food Network, it, it's easy <laughs> because they, they, share the, they share the same purpose from the beginning and they, they initiated the project. Uh, but uh, it's also the case of other platforms. I think that what helps us also is that we have several actors from uh, that believe in the in the same uh, food system in these short food chains, as I, uh, I mentioned. And when you support short food chains, you have in mind this public uh, or this uh, common interest, it's common good. Uh, so this helps. But of course, it will it will be a key, a key challenge, uh, and I want to be uh, transparent and uh, honest with you. I'm not sure I have all the answers. When we will grow, how can we make sure that uh, we are not eaten by by others? But we'll do our best. If you have ideas, uh, feel free to share. <laughs> Well, I just find it interesting because obviously if you're developing something like this, you want to be flexible, you want to be inclusive, you want to allow, allow as many users of, of these standards and, and different platforms that might be associated with it, you want to make this usable to them and attract them, but that flexibility also risks, you know, the, the commercial interests having more of a say. And I think, you know, developing some basic principles as you already have, uh, while also maintaining a little bit of flexibility is a really good uh, good sort of starting point because having those principles embedded in everything you do uh, will not only serve to kind of protect the initiative from these commercial interests, but I also think it will make, make it less interesting to them, as you point out. So, you know, if it's really intentionally attracting only people who want to support uh, short supply chains, then uh, the chances of this showing up on the radar of many of the corporate interests uh, might be lesser. So uh, I won't take up any more of your time because I do know there's a lot of other questions and Sarah hasn't even asked you anything. So I'll stop there and I might hop in later if there's a bit more time left. Thank you. Sarah? Thank you. Yeah, I also wanted to uh, thank you for that presentation. Um, and thank you, Irina, for that question. I, I actually had a very similar question uh, in, in a sense. What I was thinking a lot about uh, as you were presenting was how these kinds of technologies, um, you know, it's not about them being inherently good or bad in many ways, but it's the sort of the, de um, the development and the evolution of these technologies, softwares, tools within a particular political context um, and the highly politicized conditions that they evolve within that sort of create the landscape. And it makes me think a lot about um, all the different directions and possibilities for, for, for even you know, renewable energy technologies or other kinds of local food technologies, where it's so much about the context that then shapes the path that ends up getting sort of taken. Um, and uh, sort of the, the those surrounding regulatory and political conditions that um, you know you can foresee very very um, clearly. I think uh, what the possibilities are for these kinds of systems within a highly market based um, uh, uh, political condition versus a more maybe socially democratic or more highly uh, regulatory. Um, 
uh, situation. And so um, I'm just, I guess, similarly speaking, wondering what, whether you're thinking about the regulatory requirements and maybe in the context of France, um, but I'm also thinking about, you know, if you're interested in bringing this to an international context, uh, with intentions to work internationally, what regulatory conditions might need to be at least present? What sort of standards or minimal standards um, should we be thinking about or fighting for in the context of um, federal government? You know, right now uh, in Canada, there's a lot of conversation, many might argue there should be a lot more <laughs> around data governance um, and data standards. Um, and then we have situations, you know, again, at least in the Canadian context, um, around setting up very specific standards for, for certain uh, communities, groups of people, um, you know, so, you know, you have certain um, uh, roles and assertions for, for data ownership and position and uh, possession and control for, for instance, um, uh, OCAP standards for First Nations uh, here in, in Canada. And so just thinking about, about those components to ensure that fairness and um, uh, the, these kinds of systems move forward in a way that ensures data sovereignty. Are you thinking about any particular kinds of regulation that might need to be happen, uh, might need to happen within at least maybe the French context? It's a big uh, topic. <laughs> um, um, actually, we are uh, so we are proposing a standard, and the idea behind that is that we try to inspire uh, public organizations. And of course, there is the same kind of debate in France with uh, a lot of actors trying to get. Um, uh, higher authorities like the French state or at least the French state or also uh, various local authorities to get to have them involved in that kind of topics. It's a, it's a big topic but in the same time it's a little bit difficult sometimes to, um, to have them understand how important these topics are uh, and, uh, and, they are, um, and we believe that they, they that uh, local authorities and, and the states has a responsibility here and that they should, uh, they should implement regulations, of course. Uh, but uh, at DFC, we are more um, people that should, um, uh, that, that should support that kind of vision, that should uh, have them to understand that they should act and define some regulations. Uh, but we are not the one that will make the regulations because we are not public actors, uh, we are a private association. But we are trying our best to, uh, to make them understand their role in that. Uh, recently, we have been speaking with uh, the Paris municipality, uh, so the capital city of France. They, are, they understand that they have um, a value, that they have a role to play, but it's, it can be difficult for them to understand where they should go. So we are that kind of people that is trying to explain them uh, how standards are important uh, and, uh, and the kind of standards that we want, an open source of common standard and not an existing standard as I explained. Uh, because today they are, they are also um, uh, kind of, vic they are the victims also of that, uh, of that idea of existing uh, of existing uh, standard, so they are. Um, so we are trying to explain to them that uh, this is a, the best thing we can do. I think I'm not sure we have more power than that, but maybe uh, Rachel, you have also something to add. To this. No, not much. Indeed, um, th there are a lot of. Um, signals also coming from the European Union uh, on that level. Um, it's, it's definitely um, a topic that um, has interest, but it needs a, um, a very strong political commitment to make it happen. So 
well, for now, we're just not waiting for it. We just go and, and try to find solutions. Uh, otherwise, yes, um, other, well, other private actors are doing the same so, uh, with um, standards that are not openly governed. Um, and, and yeah, this is the, um, the problem that we see arising. Um, so um, yeah, the main, main re regulation I'm thinking of is really about um, thinking about interoperability uh, for any kind of uh, public um, and, and work use of, of data around a territory. Otherwise, yes, you're just enforcing monopolies and, and, um, and yeah, working on that approach. I think the, the Digital Markets Act, uh, correct, that the EU just rolled out addresses some of this and it targets platforms such as Facebook with a massive kind of uh, user base uh, and it designates them as gatekeepers and says, in my understanding, essentially, you guys have got to make your platform more interoperable. You can't simply pick and choose which partners you're going to allow to sort of sell through your um, platform and which ones are not. So there is some, I think, relatively progressive pressure coming from the EU on that issue, just the understanding that there's been a tremendous capture of um, attention and marketing potential by and capacity by these platforms in an attempt to sort of put some pressure to open some of these things, things up and create some openings. So, I, um, just to, I, we have a ton of questions here now, and I'm just going to sort of start rolling. <laughs> There's been uh, absolute stalwarts. Um, the first one, I think, um, this is a slightly sort of simpler um, question, but I think one that may be of interest to lots of the people on this call. Um, and it's basically just how do you define short food change? And does scaling up or scaling out of these change challenge that definition, i.e., the thing is getting bigger, if the chains are getting bigger, then at what point do they <laughs> cease to be short? I guess that's the question. Okay, uh, it's uh, when you have a direct uh, relationships between producers and consumers and eaters, uh, direct meaning either they, they really know each other, they are really in direct contact, or there is, an, uh, there is only one uh, distributors. Uh, there is only one actor uh, in the middle, but that, that's short food chains, and that doesn't mean local. It has to. It, it, it can be different from local. Usually, it comes with local, but it's not uh, only that. So it's really a question of how many people you have in the uh, uh, food distribution, and it's only one or zero in the middle, in between producer and eaters. This is the official definition of uh, the agriculture uh, ministry, I think, in France, short food chain, this is how they define it. And I guess from a sort of equity and, and business sustainability standpoint, part of the advantage of uh, small food chains is that the fewer intermediaries there are, the less there, the fewer people there are taking a cut, and the more those uh, profits remain with uh, farmers, essentially, right? Than the people producing our food. Um, so, just to keep the the questions moving, this kind of circles back um, to uh, Sarah's question, I think. Um, how do you at the DFC interact with existing international standards and organisations? And then there's a number of different. Um, cases here, such as, I'll just read a few of them, the EFCA Food X2, the Food On Ontology, or the UN Agrovoc. Um, so, so broadly speaking, just, you know, there are other folks working in similar spaces at this time or, or, or established international standards. What's your sort of method for interacting with these groups? Standards? Rachel, do you want to answer this one, or I can try, I can start to do it, if you want. Because this is the kind of questions we have every day. Um, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, it's, um, so actually, um, our idea was to start our, uh, to work to, uh, on our own standard at the beginning. It was really, okay, we started from a white page and we started to, uh, to create our own standard. But this doesn't mean we are not open to other existing standards. Of course, we will not reinvent the wheel 
uh, especially when it comes to some of the details, such as uh, units or uh, geographies or things like that. Uh, when we, we talk about things that are um, that have already st standards in uh, in the world, we try to connect uh, our standard to these existing ontologies. Um, so the, uh, so we think that we can have our own standards, but still making some relations, some links with other standards. This is totally possible on a technical standpoint. And, it, and we have to do it, actually. It's important that we do it because uh, uh, we shouldn't reinvent everything. And especially if we want to have an open standard and a shared standard, it's important that we connect. So this is something that we are already doing, but we need to... Uh, to keep improving that part and to keep connecting to other um, to other existing standards, um, and uh, but just I just want to to explain you one thing is that uh, what we have noticed is that when it comes to short food chains, there are not uh, a lot of existing standards really adapted to the reality of this sector. There are a lot of food standards that are adapted to a long food chains uh, sector, but not to short food chains, which is a specific business. And that's also why we, we decided to start our own standard at the beginning, to really have something relevant for this sector. Uh, but that doesn't mean that uh, we are uh, just uh, thinking in, uh, in our own title again, we are already open to, to other existing standards. I don't know, where Rachel, if you want to add something to this. No, no, perfect. I think it's it's really about this. Is um, um, our our standard is about yes, food. Um, but it's selling. It's about selling food in a short um, a supply chain, and um, it it should help. Uh, especially at the beginning, we are really looking at the use case of the sale. So we are looking at platform that sells and see how they can become interoperable. And, and it's, um, it's, I think we, we never found an, um, another similar work. So if you do know, please, please link us with other people doing this because it's, it's kind of a, like Clementine said, it's a tough job. It means that um, it somehow also links to traceability because uh, let's imagine a producer, let's call him Fred. Fred is producing carrots on platform A. Well, we need to know for sure that these carrots are exactly the same on platform B, um, but there are no standards on food categories, for example. So maybe the carrots on platform B are under veggies and on platform A, they're under lollipops I'm saying whatever but this is really the reality it's a nightmare to 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 link these data um, and and so far we haven't found other projects trying to do so and trying to really um, link um, data on food that are not industrialized food fresh food uh, coming out of the fields I think that was a great on the great answers there, very clarifying. So Samir Doshi asks, uh, what does this approach to more interoperable systems, which are sort of increasing accessibility and exchangeability in some respects, how does this approach also consider what they're calling the digital divide? So for populations that don't have access to technology due to socio-technical inequalities, isn't it possible that these innovations can actually exacerbate those inequalities? This is Samir's question. I'm sorry, I just want to make sure we have the question right. So it's it's around the fact that somehow we are enforcing more online sales and therefore mm -hmm. um, inequality in, in accessing um, these I food or something. That's how I would take it, yeah, that um, because um, in some facet or rather the, the work is driving, supporting the increasing uh, online sales and that you need certain amount of um, sort of capital to access these things in a way you need a certain degree of affluence but um and so what i guess what so broadly speaking i guess also it's an opportunity to talk about um just 
how questions of inequality and access feature in, in the work that you do to the extent they do. That's a tricky one, um, because I think that when it comes to accessibility, what we try to do is to uh, improve the, um, um, the current system by making it more simple for producers, avoiding them to go from platforms to another and to input data many times. So trying to make it easier for them uh, um, is a way to make it more accessible. So for uh, producers that are uh, not at ease with digital tools, that uh, kind of language can help. But in the same time, it's true that I think we, we don't address another issue, which is the, the fact that some people don't have access at all to, to the digital tools. That's, that's true. That, that's another issue. Um, uh, that I think can be addressed by other organizations, but this is, I don't know what you think, Rachel, but I think this is not our role at DFC. We are on, uh, at another level. I am not sure we can do whatever, <laughs> uh, uh, because we, this, is our, this is our position. We are positioned on digital tools, and the, the best thing we can do here is really to make them simpler and easier to, to use. But uh, the, the access to the tool itself is not our main mission. But maybe we can think about it. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good one. Yes, what I would add is that we are really trying to solve a, a problem that basically machines have because they don't see that these carrots are the same. A human can see that carrots, the example of carrots I, I gave are the same, but machine are applying in that algorithm and we want this alg algorithm to well be a bit more clever <laughs> in a way so yes yeah, so the work the dfc does is really um web centered but i think that each dfc member however has a role to play in uh, how they um, deliver their services and i think it, it's a big topic at the open food network as well um, on how to ensure that we are not enforcing um, um, and having consequences with our activity that we don't want to to uh, enforce. So this is also why, um, and I'm really speaking for the Open Food Network here, we are delivering a software, but we also building a community, which means that um, we have alternatives when people cannot buy online or when producers, well, producers can join the network even without using software. They can come because um, they meet other producers and learn how they are building their business model. And there is really a learning community um, that is quite important uh, within the network. And there are many other organizations also working on that field. Would you say it was also true that there's, um, there's an extent to which one of the the primary goals of uh, the work that you guys are doing is to make it easier um, for farmers to uh, the, to sustain them uh, to develop a livelihood essentially that this this technology is, is helping farmers reach a wider range of local customers than perhaps would be accessible if they were just combined to the one use of to the use of one platform there's an extent to which this kind of capacity building work within local food systems is just increasing the sheer kind of volume of, of locally available of food produced through short uh, supply chains. And that this, you know, indirectly, this can have a, um, an influence on the accessibility of food simply because just the, the amount of it that perhaps um, people are making a better living and can afford to drop prices, etc. I mean, I think there is at least from, from my vantage, I would say there's a kind of whole systems approach to this that says we're working on one facet of this problem, but by unlocking this one facet, we create new possibilities elsewhere as well. Let's see. Um, okay, so some more questions coming in here. Um, uh, let me just see here. So. Joe Sharma asks, are there any universities or educational institutions in France involved? Um, this is a person involved in a Canadian university and they're saying that it would be, they can point to a precedent of um, kind of connections with academic research institutions and stuff. They might be able to get some traction like they are here in Canada. Yeah, 
Yes, there are, there are some. Uh, as I said, uh, the, um, uh, the most involved people today are more uh, researchers uh, from INHAE and NHT. So they are more expert researchers, not schools per se, but we have already started to build relationships with some of them, with some technical schools, uh, with some uh, schools working in the uh, digital uh, subjects. So we have started to do so. So it's more uh, scientific or kind of schools. So we have started to build that kind of relationships historically. And we need today to get them uh, involved uh, again in the projects because um, over the past few months uh, or even the past few uh, uh, years, we've been um, working a lot on technical uh, issues, as I said. Uh, and we are at a point where we need to, to, uh, to re-explore our network and to really rebuild relationships with the different actors and schools are uh, concerned by that but we have already some connections yes and i can share with you some names but i'm not sure that people here will, uh, will know these, these schools but they are they are <laughs> they are working on technical science that kind of scientific technical kind of uh, schools and so um, Matt Noyes has a question here, um, and this is kind of um, in line with Irina's question. How do you guys, at the, how, how does the Data Food Consortium approach and work with platforms that are being, being developed on a proprietary venture capital backed basis with no data or platform sovereignty and they're sort of built into their business model? Rachel, do you want to answer that one? Yes, um, actually, yeah, thank you for that question, because we got this a lot, because uh, in the early members and contributors also of the project around the table was the Food Assembly, which is um, a startup that, um, uh, well, had um, a, a very uh, powerful and large marketing and, and communication approach on the short food chain market in France, but also in other countries in Europe. Um, and most of the time, producers were pointing that um, there are, well, a property software uh, with the non-open governance and, and po data policy that wasn't um, aligned with uh, values that, for example, the Open Food Network could um, defend. Um, nevertheless, um, they were uh, completely aligned with having and implementing the, the standard and giving that power to the, their producers. So our answer to this, to this was, let's welcome everyone. I mean, if tomorrow all the users of um, platforms involved in short food chain um, have power of the, over their data, no matter the platform they are putting their data into, we, we the data, the DFC would have won their, their goal. I mean, um, the, the, the goal is really to empower the data pro producer <laughs> at some point, whether it's a consumer or a producer or a distributor. And then it's really on the individual to decide, yeah, I want to push my product catalog on this act uh, uh, to sell stuff. Well, up to you. And tomorrow you don't want to, to work with that platform anymore well you just uh, remove um, your um, permission that you gave this platform this tool um, so I don't know if it answered the question but this is kind of the vision we are not um, open well we're welcoming basically everyone to to join the the adventure whether they have a particular uh, license or not The only, I think, criteria we do have is actually that if they contribute, however, the contribution is pushed uh, on open source licenses. And also, uh, we didn't mention, but all the work we did so far, yes, we are between French members, but we, we tried to translate it into English. If you see stuff that are weirdly formulated, 
I really apologize, but we, uh, from the beginning, we are trying to put it in English, all the work we did. We did. And that's available via Gitbook and GitHub uh, in the data free consortium. Yeah. They are all in English. It's only English. The uh, Git, uh, Gitbook and Hub. We have a website that is in French and English. Uh, um, our website is actually uh, quite uh, short today, but we have just an updated version that is about to be online. Uh, the French version is ready um, to go online, and the English version will be ready in the next few weeks. We just need to translate. But so uh, we really uh, make our best to translate everything in English, especially when it gets uh, technical. So it's heroic work, guys. Um, so we've got another question here. Um, that, so somebody thanked, the, it's an anonymous uh, contributor, but they say, thank you for the generative talk. And they're asking, what is the business model for the consortium? Uh, this is super important work. What in, uh, institutional or funding supports are in place to secure the long-term so sustainability of the initiative? So I, I, I mentioned this. So see, today it is supported by, uh, it's really an association supported by donations, private and public donations from various uh, organizations. And we are supported by Ile de France, so this is the Parisian region, basically. Uh, they support us until 2024 uh, with a big donation. So they, they, this is a uh, a good support and we uh, also got the support uh, from uh, one private foundation uh, Carasso it's linked to the De uh, Denon company um, so we have the support of these actors but it's a very interesting question how do we ensure the that we have a sustainable um, uh, model on the long term and uh, we have to find our way uh, to uh, to uh, become independent and to not re rely too much on these donations. And this is something we need to think about. Uh, we don't have the answer today. We have some ideas, as I mentioned. Uh, if at some point we implement a very uh, interesting standard that a lot of users uh, uh, use, uh, maybe at some point we can ask some uh, fees, some contributions from these users for the maintenance of the systems. Uh, and uh, we can also think about all the services or, or products uh, that we could sell, but we need to really to build uh, the business model. Today, it's really a non-profit kind of model based on donations. And it works so far. It has been, it works, but, uh, but this is something we need to, uh, to work on. So we have a question uh, from Jeff. Most people I know involved in short food chain systems have quite limited resources or bandwidth to be able to participate to participate in development projects like this. And this can make it quite hard to include them in a meaningful way. Are there examples in your projects, and these could be plans, of providing support um, to facilitate stakeholder engagement, for example, as part of a participatory action research project or something of that nature. Richard? Yes, so uh, we have two types of participants. We have um, tools and platforms. And it, on that level, it is true that they are, there are some platforms that um, we, we, we are kind of using also a cutting edge technology and it's, it's an important investment to today invest some time in, okay, I'm trying to implement a standard that is quite new. And of course there are going to be a, a lot of back and forth and, and stuff to, to, to change and, and improve. Uh, so it's really a, a, a commitment. Um, this is why also the money we have raised so far, we have we have tried to to uh, raise uh, some part of it to help tools to implement the, the standards and and improve it because we we know this is the uh, early days. Um, and secondly, we have all the users that will be impacted by. 
by these changes in the different platforms. And on that level, yes, we definitely, there are many producers that don't have time for this, they just want to have a, a tool that works. Uh, but there are also others that um, are really committed to, to see this happening because they have all their uh, turnover uh, on short food chain and they really don't want to go back to selling for supermarkets um, and they they really um, give us time and 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 feedback uh, on how it works best for them so um, I think in the coming uh, and next steps we will have there are a lot of UX work that will happen um, and and for this we we will need uh, a lot of volunteers um, but maybe we can also raise money to help that and and help uh, other smaller um, actors to participate Um, I have one last question. Um, this is from Joe Bobman. And Joe writes, I work at a food waste diversion program and we see and interact with multiple steps on the food distribution chain. In your experience, who were the actors that led and contributed to the success of this interoperable system? For example, was it government, growers, packing houses, houses, wholesalers, transportation, grocers, etc. Sorry, can you repeat that one? Uh, who are the ones that are uh, most involved? Oh, it, what yeah, I'll, I'll just reread the beginning of the question then. So I work at a food waste diversion program and we see and interact with multiple steps on the food distribution chain. In your experience, who were the actors in the short food distribution chain that led to and contributed most to the success of this project, essentially? Um, Rachel, do you want to, uh, to answer yeah. because you have more mm. historical background? I can uh, have some ideas, but maybe you you would be uh, the best one. Yes, um, I would say that all the first actors that uh, joined in and said, "Okay, let's let's work towards more interoperability between us," were all um, actors that were completely specialized in short food chain. Um, even though uh, we we had some lot of work early on uh, with, um, for, for example, um, there there is a, a huge organization um, um, giving numbers and barcodes to to products. Uh, so this was, for example, some um, part part of it was. Uh, Part of our work was really around um, um, analyzing if this um, could be also some part of the solution. Um, but uh, the members of these organizations were, were not well following, but not really taking active part and active contribution. It was really um, actors of the short food chain system that were completely um, specialized in, in it and with I must say, a um, more technical background. The, the, because the solution was really around a new way of, of building tech web tools. Uh, it attracted also a lot of expertise uh, from that. And then followed, um, I would say, financial support from uh, territories and um, um, also some private foundation that were really uh, close to what um, um, the Open Food Network was doing, but it took several years to make these actors understand um, the, um, the, the problems that were trying to be solved and, and accept that there is a high risk of, um, it's, a, it's a, again, not a, the simple solution but it's the long-term best bet uh, that they need to invest on well thank you so much everyone and uh, thank you for these uh just sticking with us and answering all these in-depth questions we really appreciate the uh your time and uh the energy that goes into doing that um so and thank you to uh, uh um respondents serena and sarah really appreciate your involvement in this and again Laurie Center of Sustainable Food Systems, thank you for helping us co-host. 
uh, this event. And so everyone that came and attended, we're delighted to have so many folks with us on a, a what is in Canada, a, 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 a more, a, like early, relatively early morning. And so that's, uh, that's everything from us, I think. And uh, once again, thanks so much for participating in the event. If you have follow-up questions, our email and contact information is all available online. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. And Sarah, thank you, everybody. Thank you.